just be your guys With this podcast at your side You'll be on your way to being qualified It's the Aspiring Psychologist Podcast With Dr. Marianne Trent Welcome along to the Aspiring Psychologist podcast. Thank you so much as ever for joining me. I am absolutely delighted that so many of you are finding this content useful. We very recently celebrated our 5,000th download, which means that 5,000 of the episodes have been listened to. And I am thrilled with that. Um, You know, We launched um, Christmas Eve 2021, and so it's been four months, so 5,000 downloads in four months for our really pretty niche market um, is just wonderful. So thank you again. If you do like what we do with this podcast, then please do take a moment just to drop in to um, the podcast app on Apple uh, and uh, rate it, uh, rate the podcast. Um, And you can do that by finding the podcast, the Aspiring Psychologist podcast in the podcast Apple app, um, scrolling to the bottom um, and then right below the trailer, right to the bottom, Um, you will find um, just where you can click on the stars to rate it. That will take you like, you know, 10 seconds. If you've got a few more moments, I would be thrilled if you left us a review as well, uh, because reviews and ratings help us demonstrate that other people might also find it useful. If you'd like to go one better and you'd like to leave us an audio testimonial to be used within the podcast for either the podcast itself, the book or the Aspiring Psychologist membership, I would be absolutely thrilled to to have your voice um, on the podcast. And you can be anonymous or you can use your name too. With that in mind, we are still recruiting um, people to write for the Aspiring Psychologist Collective. Um, And if you would like to write with your actual name, that's okay. If you'd like us to give you a pseudonym, that is also okay. You can find details of all of this stuff by heading to um, my Linktree account, which is probably most easily found by clicking on the show notes. But if you do follow me on any of my social media, um, then you can also click uh, the link in my bio is also my link tree. Um, So yeah, find me that way. But do come and connect. I love to help you celebrate on social media when you have significant milestones in your career, um, like new jobs, you know, um, graduating um, and just doing, you know, nice stuff in your life. So come and connect, come and follow me, um, interact with my content and let's get to know each other better because that helps me know what you want me to create for you in this podcast too. Um, I am very excited to bring to you today um, Dr. Lucy Johnston. She is someone that when I was an aspiring psychologist, I really looked up to and um, was inspired by her work. Um, And so I honestly couldn't believe it when I reached out to her to invite her along um, to speak to us on the podcast and she was so happy to take part so I hope you'll find this useful her work is incredibly valid incredibly important um, to you as aspiring psychologists and even qualified psychologists too so I hope you'll find this a really inspiring really thought-provoking episode and as ever um, would love any feedback or thoughts that you've got on it Um, enjoy and I will catch you on the other side So we are welcoming along Dr. Lucy Johnston to us um, with the podcast today. Welcome along, Lucy. Thank you. Thank you for asking me. Oh, thank you for saying yes. (laughs) I feel like your work um, has been so important to me as an aspiring psychologist, a trainee psychologist and a qualified psychologist as well. Good. I'm glad to hear that. (laughs) Could you tell us a little bit about you and, and your work? Um, Well, I've been a psychologist, a clinical psychologist for a very long time. 
Um, I've always worked in adult mental health settings and I've worked partly in clinical settings, but I've partly worked um, uh, in training and in uh, for a while I worked at uh, one of the local universities in Bristol. So it's been quite a mixed career. Um, I actually gave up clinical work at the end of 2016 and I'm currently describing myself as self-employed. I do writing and training. So this is a new and unexpected part of my career, in fact. And the same themes have followed me throughout my work, really, which is thinking about alternatives to the diagnostic model of distress. And um, everything I've written or done has been a variation on that theme. Brilliant. Um, and yeah, you first crossed my path when I was um, yeah, trying to get um, interviews onto clinical training and uh, talking about formulation. Could you tell us a little bit about your um, yours and uh, Rudy Dallas's book on formulation, how that came to be? OK, so as we know, formulation is a core skill of clinical psychologists um, and I have always used it. I was trained to use formulation as all psychologists are. I hadn't I think I probably hadn't thought a huge amount about the subject until I um, took up a post on a clinical psychology doctorate myself. And then I was in a position of training other people in using formulation. And it seemed to me that there was a big gap in the market. There's, there were a few books out there and a few articles, but actually considering this is meant to be our core professional skill, there wasn't a, a lot of really in-depth, thoughtful look at what formulation is, what it isn't, what its uses are, what its drawbacks are, what the controversies are, what the different perspectives of formulation might look like, depending on which model you start with. So uh, Rudy was working on the Plymouth course, which it, um, which um, was closely linked to the Bristol one, and we put on a workshop. Lots of people came along. It seemed to be a subject people are interested in, and out of that arose the book, um, which is now in its second edition. The first edition came out in 2000. The second edition came out in 2014. Well, I'm so thankful that you did. And for me, you were really one of the, you know, the trailblazers for mm. clinical psychologists creating books as well. Certainly one of the first I was aware of. And so, you know, you showed me that that we could and, you know, we've got something useful to say that we should. So um, an extra thank you to that, uh, to you on that one as well. But, um, you know, it's what I really like about the book and why our audience will find it particularly useful is that you uh, you introduce, um, you know, vignettes, don't you, of um, case studies, and then you formulate them from a variety of different perspectives throughout the book. So you, you it just, it's just really well done. Well, thank you. It was quite a lot of work. <laughs> and there are a number of contributors. And as you say, the common thread of the book is we take two case histories, which are based on real people, one is an adult man and the other is a child and her family. And the various chapters look at how we might formulate their difficulties from different perspectives. Uh, the standard ones, CBT, psychodynamic and so on, but um, also perhaps less common approaches like narrative therapy and, so and social equalities approaches and so on. Um, at the end, there's a chapter about controversies and debates, which I hope kind of ties the whole book up and leaves us thinking, well, you know, we should have a critical perspective on anything, everything. That's always been what I believe. So, of course, I'm broadly in favour of formulation. I've done a lot of training in it um, as well as practising, but I don't think we should be doing anything without thinking very carefully about what we're doing, why we're doing it, how it could be helpful, but also how perhaps sometimes it can be unhelpful because, you know, there's no simple, perfect answer to anyone's difficulties. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, when, when we share formulations with people and when we share um, diagnoses with people, we, we're absolutely thinking about it as being a way of understanding their difficulties, but not necessarily defining them and, you know, them as a person. Yes, although, um, as I've suggested in some cases I would hope we wouldn't be sharing diagnoses <laughs> so, uh, and as I another theme of the book is really that psychologists have something much better to offer than the vast majority of psychiatric diagnoses I mean mm. obviously depending on which setting you work there are valid diagnoses if you're working you know in learning difficulties or in health settings diagnoses may be may be appropriate and helpful they are virtually never so in adult mental health settings and so um, I very much 
want to promote formulation as something we can do instead and something that offers uh, what diagnosis claims but fails to offer us, which is an evidence-based hypothesis and a way forward that can lead people out of services, we hope, rather than, as much too often happens, trap them within services, possibly for many decades. Mm -hmm. My work is um, in adult mental health as well. And so much of the work I do around developmental trauma is people, mm -hmm. you know, really finding it very difficult and very uncomfortable and very painful to have gone mm -hmm. through, you know, complex trauma and then find themselves with diagnoses which feel like an added insult to, to their injuries. Um, you know, if they end up with a, a personality disorder diagnosis, they you know, they Google that and they feel that like it doesn't describe me at all. And it, yeah, I think it's a useful conversation to have. I think it's an essential conversation to have. And, you know, I absolutely think as psychologists, we should routinely be having these conversations with people who will often come up along to us, sort of pre pre labeled, if you like. They're told they have a diagnosis of some sort. I mean, a common diagnosis, as you say, particularly for women who may very frequently have a history of trauma, is a so-called personality disorder of some sort. Now, I've always believed that people have the right to make up their own minds about how best to describe their difficulties, but I very strongly believe that that should be a kind of informed choice and we should be letting people know these are controversial labels. They're not scientifically valid. They, you know, even the people who draw up the diagnostic manuals are saying this, these systems of categorization are neither safe nor scientifically sound. That's a quote from the chair of the DSM-4 committee. You know, it's, it's not professionally acceptable for us not to inform people of that. And of course, they may need their diagnoses for some purposes. They may actually feel it describes them quite well, but very frequently people don't feel that. And we can then obviously offer them a formulation based understanding instead, but also, as you suggest, a trauma informed understanding. So more recently, you know, I've become very interested in trauma informed approaches. And uh, I think all formulations need to be trauma informed, which, of course, doesn't mean that every person we meet has experienced what we might classically describe as a trauma, but it means we need to be very, very aware of the fact that that may well be the case and we need to incorporate that in our formulating. Certainly, but I don't know what your experiences are, Lucy, but working in adult mental health, people often tell me, I don't know why I feel like this, you know, I feel like I've had a good enough childhood and, you know, I don't know it's probably just me and then you actually go through you know key you know the ace scale for example or thinking yeah. about developmental experiences and you realize and you help them appreciate that actually their needs and their difficulties can be understood within a diagnosis or a framework of um of complex trauma and that can be incredibly you know validating and empowering for them but also you know takes away a lot of that guilt and that shame and that responsibility that they've been carrying for being the problem in it being their fault. Indeed. I mean, the trouble with a diagnostic label, it sort of locates the problem within the person, doesn't it? And a lot of psychological explanations do as well, to be honest. I mean, I'm not just opposed to unscientific diagnostic categories, but also to narrowly individualising psychological ways of categorising people, essentially. So, as you say, a lot of people will say and this may well be true I had a comfortable home and I had loving parents but things that can be experienced as traumatic can be a lot more subtle than that of course there can be more subtle forms of invalidation and emotional neglect which we don't always identify as such and also we live in a difficult world don't we you know I think there are many many good reasons for, for really struggling however fortunate we are in our families and our, and our lives and young people, I think, particularly are facing horrendously difficult challenges nowadays. I'm very glad I'm no longer young because I think it's a difficult world, a very difficult world for young people to live in. Yeah, I agree. Social media certainly adds new mm. layers of um, of difficulties. Um, and I found being a teenager <laughs> difficult mm. enough as yeah, it was. It's bad enough anyway. Yes. Think how much worse it is if you're also being bullied on social media, you know, and being told you ought to look like this, have these kind of friendships, live this kind of lifestyle, all those kind of things. And, you know, mental health, social media is not always helpful either. There's a, I think, a 
rather regrettable tendency for people nowadays to be self-diagnosing, not even waiting to see a professional to Google or look at a TikTok video that tells them they have something called ADHD or autism spectrum disorder or whatever. And to kind of find a sense of identity through that, which I can see the attraction of, but actually I don't think that's necessarily in the long term helpful and you know, we seem to be rapidly reaching the point where we're all all going to be qualifying for a di diagnosis of some sort. So that's one of the themes of um, uh, the second edition of my book, The Straight Talking Introduction to Psychiatric Diagnosis, which came out just last week. Uh, first edition was 2014. And one of the trends that's it's, um, increased very significantly since 2014 is the whole social media stuff both I think in terms of making all of us feel somehow less adequate and less okay about ourselves and in the form of offering kind of ways out in the terms of labeling ourselves, which I think you know is a trend that we need to think about very carefully because I think it may well have more disadvantages than advantages. Yeah, absolutely. Congratulations on your newest book, Baby, um, for, for this year, very recent, this week. Um, and I think, yeah, absolutely, we need to be careful about diagnosing ourselves and, and looking at labels. But I think for the general public, it's also really important to think about who is labelling themselves as something they may not be. Um, so I often see people who might have done a psychology degree um, or, you know, a counselling certificate, calling themselves a psychologist um, mm -hmm. publicly. And that can be really damaging and really dangerous. And part mm -hmm. of my most recent media work is to try to encourage people to know what what you might look for in a qualified therapist, a qualified yeah, yeah. psychologist. Indeed. Well, yeah. there are plenty of bad psychologists and bad <laughs> therapists out there, I'm afraid. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Um, I have been asked a couple of questions from our aspiring psychologist audience yeah. for our formulation expert. Is there um, a go-to formulation stance or approach that you'd recommend for people to kind of keep in their back pocket to pull out an um, a interview or, you know, at any moment of pressure where they're asked for formulation? Uh, it's interview season at the moment, isn't it? So there's going to be lots of people anxiously swatting up what is a formulation I mean, you know, if you want to be a bit strategic about it, most courses are going to be looking for some kind of awareness of and competence in CBT. And I think CBT has strengths and I think it has, has some limitations. But I guess it probably be important in that situation to show awareness of the various versions of CBT formulation. But as people get trained and as they develop their own personal style, I think it's really important that we move beyond any particular model held on to too closely, if you like. So the um, book that we've just talked about, Formulation in Psychology and Psychotherapy, has a whole chapter on integrative, integrative approaches. And I personally think we're almost inevitably going to be missing something unless our approach is to some extent integrative. So what, what the particular ingredients are of your own integrative approach will be up to you. But as I've already said, I think a trauma-informed perspective should be one of them. And I, I mean, I see myself as coming fundamentally from a psychodynamic perspective, I guess, but other people might you know, have their own preferences. And in fact, in 2011, um, I was uh, the leader author in a small group of people who drew up the Division of Clinical Psychology good practice guidelines on the use of psychological formulation. It's a while ago now, but I think they're still very relevant. And one of the things we said in those guidelines was that psychologists really need to be starting from as broad a base as they can in terms of their formulations, even if any particular situation, they choose a narrower or more specific formulation or model. And, and, and I still think that's very true. Let's think as widely as possible then we'll be in a better position to think about, you know, which of our tools or approaches or perspectives is going to be more helpful for this particular person. Thank you. That's so interesting. And I really, really are speaking to the expert in this. I'm really honoured to have you here. I tend to start any assessment or formulation that I do with a family tree um, mm. and trying to get an understanding of people's relationships, who's alive, who's not alive, you know, the context yeah. of relationships. It can be really really powerful and really enlightening and it's something I first learned in in a CAM service but mm -hmm. I still do it now you know years and years and years later it can be really enlightening 
I think that's a very good place to start. You know, there are a number of good places to start. And the way, that, the reason that sounds useful to me is because it's immediately starting from the context, isn't it? It's going to be, you're going to be less likely to come up with something that's perhaps more individualising in an unhelpful way. Yeah, and the question, why now, is also... <laughs> why, why now, indeed? What started it? The, the trigger, in the jargon terms, triggers are nearly always significant because they nearly always stand for something much broader or much more complex about a person's life and their struggles. So why now? What understandings do you have? What diagnostic understandings may you've come across? Shall we talk about that? <laughs> what are your goals? But, I mean, centrally, formulation is about meaning it's about co-constructing meaning so in the we've used this very much a thread in the dcp guidelines and formulation the idea that essentially what a formulation is is about co-constructing meaning and meaning is the thread that integrates whatever other aspects of the formulation you're going to be discussing which is why we have some reservations in the guidelines about some of the more popular types of formulation like the five p's I'm not a big fan of the five P's myself, because the trouble is it can just end up the list of factors. This happened, this happened, this happened. And I think that's the stage before a formulation. I think an actual formulation is when you show how all these things hang together and the thread on which they hang together is the meaning that you've made of them. And so one of my favourite definitions of formulation is um, an ongoing process of collaborative meaning making which in a way describes therapy as a whole, but it also describes a particular part of therapy, which you might at some point choose to summarise or write down or share, which is what we call the formulation. Yeah, I think of your um, longitudinal formulation, which I think takes up a whole page in your book as being really gold standard. And I can't, mm. I can't tell you the hours I spent studying that and mm. trying to replicate that and bolt that on for my clients um, during my own um, studies. It's just honestly really useful. Um, and your don't, triangles. Don't think, don't think that was mine personally. That was, some, that was another author. <laughs> but, yes, <laughs> well, that's, it's that's really, that's really useful. useful. And your, tri your triangles as well, you know, they save me uh, quite a lot triangles. of time. Yeah, yeah, the triangles are good. <laughs> but I mean, there are lots of ways of doing it. And one of the other things I like to say is that I don't think we want to make this into too scary sounding a skill because actually we're all human beings. This is something we do automatically. We make meaning, you know, we try to make sense of our lives. It's a particular way of doing things, but I wouldn't want to think or to be giving the message that only psychologists can do this. Lots of professionals can do this. And indeed, formulation is finding its way into the core competencies of a number of different professions. And human beings do it. You know, our mums or our friends or, you know, authors, novelists may also be, in a broader sense, very skilled formulators. So it's a particular take which has particular uses in service, I think, on a general you know human skill absolutely and i think maybe the word scares people off i think one of the it does. <laughs> yeah it, it does scare people off yeah like here's something terribly fancy that i've got to be very good at but one yeah. of the most mortifying things that could happen to me um, as an aspiring psychologist was when we were in ward round and the psychiatrist would turn to me and say, well, what's your formulation on this? And then they'd just be like a tumbleweed moment. But, you know, if they'd been able to say, what's your understanding of why this is happening yeah, yeah, yeah. now and why? Well, that's all it means, really. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that I always say is that formulation isn't a thing that you have to produce or perfectly worked out at any given moment in a ward round or in your notes or whatever it's a it's it's a process really we've discussed this in the guidelines the distinction between formulation as an event which is how you probably encounter it on a course you write it down you submit it it comes back with scribbles all over it you resubmit it <laughs> or perhaps you don't perhaps it was very good first time round and formulation as a process because really that event is only a snapshot of an ongoing discussion process really and meanings are always evolving and when I was in training, I would be encouraging the trainees to be formulating in a sense before you even meet the person. You will have some kind of information from the notes or the referral. And obviously, you have to hold that tentatively. It might be wrong. And it, quite often, it's way off the mark. But nevertheless, it's a starting point. And your understandings and their understandings you know, evolve and continue and are always open to kind of reflection and change.
Mm, definitely. That's certainly something that I learned to do um, during my fifth placement, actually, was to come ready, prepared to my first supervision session um, with my <laughs> on you know, almost on day one, having read the files and come up with my own sort of idea of formulations, which mm-hmm. um, at the time felt a bit horrifying, but actually mm-hmm. is, um, you know, a real use, useful way for us yeah, yeah. using that reading time um, in a constructive way. Mm. Yeah, and your first formulation is going to be very tentative and it might be a sentence, you know. It sounds like some difficult things happened earlier on in your life and recent events have brought some of those to the surface. I mean, that's that's a, a useful, nearly all-purpose formulation in mental health for when someone first presents. Or I sometimes say in training, you know, trauma in the context of attachment difficulties will cover vast numbers of mental health clients, not, not all of them as a kind of, I wonder if this is a place to start formulation, that's that's not a bad place to start. Absolutely. How, I'm interested, how are you finding having stepped away from, um, from more clinical work recently? How are you adjusting to that? Well, it's, it's kind of different. I miss clinical work. I do miss clinical work. But the reason I stepped away is to do something rather different, which was to, um, well, first of all, to finish the Power Threat Meaning Framework, which is this very, very ambitious project to outline a conceptual alternative to the diagnostic model of distress. Uh, I'm the one of the lead authors, along with Professor Mary Boyle, who's another psychologist, and it's co-produced by a group of psychologists and service users, survivors, all of whom have known each other for many years, funded by the Division of Clinical Psychology. And we were uh, embarked on this ludicrously ambitious task to to think about not just how can we use formulation instead of diagnosis, let's say, or how can we use trauma-informed practice instead of medical model practice, but what would a complete conceptual alternative the diagnostic model look like? What would it look like to make the giant leap away from medical model understandings towards well, towards what? That was the task we set ourselves. What would a very different way of identifying patterns of distress look like? So we, five years later, we emerged with this massive document. I think you're going to supply the links in the chat to the website. And the reason I gave up clinical work was because I and Mary both in the end had to spend virtually two years sitting in front of our computers and actually making sure this damn thing was reached a stage where it's ready to be published and since then it's quite unexpected to become my job so I do a lot of training and writing and traveling and talking and uh, podcasts and all sorts of things in relation to the power threat meaning framework mm-hmm. so you know I've missed clinical work and I found something to replace it which is kind of related and equally important actually and in some ways it summarizes all the thinking I've done throughout my career and the same is true I think of the other people who are involved in the project. It sounds like fascinating stuff and absolutely when this goes live we'll pop any links in the Mm. show notes so that people can access this really um really useful and there's like like seminal (laughs) seminal stuff you know it's it's an exciting time um to be to be putting that out there um is there any other advice that you would offer for aspiring psychologists um well first of all i mean you know clinical psychology isn't the be all and end all (laughs) it's it's hard to get on a course if you don't, there are other options. You could end up working in a very similar way from some different career path. You know, I think it's a great career path, but I think people become very fixated on this is what I must do. They And one of the paradoxical effects of that is when you get onto a course and find it's not perfect, it can feel quite frustrating and disappointing. You know, so realistic expectations, there are other options. I think, I think the other thing I would say is, I mean, critical thinking is so important, which is again something I've always believed so you will have to read and believe and study and say certain things in order to get onto a course in order to do your psychology degree in the first place a a lot of it in my view is completely wrong (laughs) possibly most of it I have fundamental disagreements with a lot of the core tenets of clinical psychology practice so really 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 don't necessarily believe what you're told think about it explore alternatives you know develop your own style your own beliefs 
question everything you've been told. It's all up for grabs, really. We are at quite an exciting time, I think, in what we call mental health. It's not a term I like, actually, but the experiences we call mental health and how we understand them. We are at a point of very rapidly shifting understandings, which is great, but that means really being able to challenge ourselves and things that we've always thought and believe without question. So question everything is uncomfortable, but I think in the in the end it gets you to a better and more interesting place. Yeah, and it certainly can um, facilitate more strategic conversations, can't it? Yeah. Which is, yeah. you know, we, we're good at rattling cages um, in the psychology profession. Well, some of us are. Some of us are. Some of us are a bit too happy not to rattle cages, in my view. <laughs> I think... What I see as, as people are progressing through their routes um, towards becoming, um, you know, trainee psychologist or whatever, whatever type of psychologist they want to become is something alluding to what you've said there is that they become more, yeah, more confident in their own way of seeing the world and are less, you know, less affected or less asking or, you know, less striving for input yeah. from others. And they just feel ready to hold their head up at interview and say, well, this is how I see the world. This is how I understand it using this, that approaches, but this is my take on it. And I think that's really powerful. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it is, it is. And the framework I hope gives people quite a lot of leeway to think about how they might want to understand their work, you know, the assumptions behind their work, the difficulties people come up, present with because it's a set of ideas, it's really not a sort of how-to manual, it's about as far as you, away as you can possibly get from, let's say, a stereotypical, you know, IAPT-based, really rigid, manualised approach, which I have to say I'm not in favour of. Right the other end of the, that spectrum is something like the framework, and the message really is look at these ideas and think about how they might make use to you, how they might be useful to you. And one of the things we've done in the framework is to try and move beyond formulation as such. So uh, formulation, I think, as I said, is an extraordinarily useful tool within services. We've deliberately used the term narrative in the power threat meaning framework because it is, broadly speaking, a narrative-based approach. The simple answer to what do we do instead of diagnosis in framework terms is we use narrative-based understandings. But if we broaden narrative to include art, music, poetry, dance, you know, community rituals, legends, understandings, then we can include a whole range of ways of understanding a healing distress, which historically have always been around, which cross-culturally still are around, and validate all of those as well without needing to, to package in package it in, you know, actually very westernised, narrow westernised way as psychology or psychotherapy or psychiatry. So that allows us, I think, to accommodate and learn from and work much more comfortably alongside non-westernised understandings of distress without feeling the need to colonise them with our own psychiatric categories or psychological categories. You know, in both cases, those may be inappropriate. Yeah. So when I presented the framework recently, actually, to a group of uh, third-year clinical psychologists and uh, trainees, one of them said to me, so how would I you know, use the framework in this setting that I'm hoping to work in? So I said, well, you can use it how you like. <laughs> we don't have the answer. Try it out. Let us know. You know, write it up if it seems to work. This will contribute further to the framework. So this trainee said, that's extraordinary. You mean I'm allowed to do how I like? I don't have to come up with, you know, some massively detailed according to the manual version. That's so refreshing. And I found that comment a little bit depressing actually because really you know to be steered into you know expert driven narrow manualized ways of thinking at quite an early stage of your career and being told you have to do it this way is not a helpful starting point I think. Mm, I think there's definitely some overlap there with um you know what we're doing to our aspiring psychologists on yeah. the way up especially in services where there's high demand and lots yeah. and lots of client hours in an IAPT service for example yeah. you know our, our our aspiring psychologists are burning out they're feeling yeah, yeah. disillusioned they're not being well supported and that's a right. I know it's a separate conversation but it's really yeah, important yeah. well it's kind of it's kind of related because that comes out of a particular I would say ideological strand of clinical psychology doesn't it that these very narrow versions of CBT you know, which is not CBD practice as a whole, are somehow more evidence-based, 
whatever that means, and we've deconstructed that term in the framework, what counts as evidence, who decides, who benefits from it, whose voices are excluded and silenced by it, and so on. And actually, IAPT is not producing good outcomes. Well, I don't think that's surprising, and I think it can be, as you say, quite a damaging experience for those who are persuaded they need to, they have to offer a kind of assembly line version of this intervention for this narrowly defined problem. Yeah, people are saying to me, you know, I do, I'm sort of here now, but I don't even know if I want to do this now. Yeah, you yeah know? Well, that's, that's a shame. I mean, that, and that's worrying. And it's part of a bigger and also very worrying trend where, you know, I think it's about individualising distress, to be honest. People who turn up at IAP services have very good reasons to distress, which are very often have much broader roots than their negative thinking or whatever it is you're supposed to target. That's, you know... So actually, we're missing the main point often. Absolutely. Have you got any advice that you wish you'd been told or that you'd give to your younger self, Lucy? Um, don't work so hard. <laughs> it's too late for that. I'm a bit of a workaholic and uh, I mean, this is a more personal thing. You know, I, I, I wish I'd gone half time when my kids were young and so on. Life was quite stressful. But I mean, otherwise, I've always been very pleased to have had the career I've had. I, I think it suited me really well. And, you know, of course, there are things I wish I'd learned sooner or done differently. But I mean, that's that's part of the process, isn't it? I think at any point of our lives, and especially when we're working with clients as well, doing a bit of a joy audit can be really useful, looking at where we're getting joyful or enjoyable experiences. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's certainly something that I hold on to. Um, yeah. It's really important, you know. If we're yeah, if we're all work and no play, then it's not, not much no, fun. Well, it doesn't feel much fun. Indeed, indeed, and you know, I've had an awful lot of fun and joy through my work, but actually, I've probably at times got that out of balance with the rest of my life. Is there anything that you wish I'd asked you that we haven't? I think we've covered most things, to be honest. And I think we've covered okay. most things. And as you say, there are we'll put some links for anyone who wants to follow up any of these thoughts or ideas. I certainly will. Where can people get hold of copies of your books, Lucy? Um, I've sent you some links. So, I mean, they're available on the usual places, the rather unethical places that we tend to go to because they're just easy and cheap and quick. But um, piece, several of uh, my two most recent books, the one on the Path Right Meaning Framework with Mary Boyle and the second edition of the book on diagnosis are available through PCCS books actually more cheaply than on Amazon. Very good advice. I'll make sure that I pop the links to that in um, in the show notes. But honestly, Marianne, who was in her mid um, early to mid twenties, um, meeting you today at forty, I just you know I feel incredibly lucky and to have held your book in my hands and it's sort of shaped my career and now go on to shape other people's careers. You know. Thank you from me to you and from all the other aspiring and qualified psychologists across the land and the world. Um, you know what you what you have done really matters, and it's really helped us shape things with with our clients as well. People you'll never meet, but your work has touched them and benefited them. Well, that's lovely to hear. Thank you. Sorry, it's taken fifteen years for us to meet, but <laughs> thank you and good luck to everyone watching. I should have asked sooner. <laughs> <laughs> you <should>. <laughs> uh, but thank you very much and you're everything I hoped you would be and yeah I will um, you know look forward to connecting with you in future and I will definitely okay. get hold of a copy of your book thank you Lucy thank you, thank you so for much for listening and thank you to our guest Dr Lucy Johnston for so um, generously giving us her time to think about these very important issues um, I hope that you will find it thought-provoking and it will resonate with you as I record this, there are spaces available on the Aspiring Psychologist membership. If you'd like any information on how to join the membership and how to be part of my world, then please do check out um, my link tree, Dr. Marianne Trent, which you can grab in the show notes um, or via any of my socials. 
depending on when you're listening to this, we have the final planned compassionate Q&A um, to support people during this um, tricky application and interview season. Um, so it is scheduled to take place on Monday the 9th of May um, at 7.30 p.m. UK time. And that will be happening across all of my socials um, streaming um, simultaneously. So um, if you have an interview or you know someone that does, then do direct them um, that way. You can also watch on replay and you can also um, watch all of the previous um, Q&As that I have done by heading to my um, link tree. There's a playlist there. Um, or alternately, you can go straight to the Good Thinking Psychological Services YouTube page and check out the, um, the playlist there, which is for Q&As for aspiring psychologists. Right. I think that is all of our bits and pieces covered for today. If you would like to leave any sort of audio testimonial for the podcast or any of the other content that I'm involved in, I would be thrilled um, to include it within the podcast episodes. Thank you for being part of my world. Stay kind to yourselves and I will catch you very soon. Take care. If you're looking to become a psychologist, then let this be your guide. With this podcast at your side, you'll be on your way to being qualified. It's the Aspiring Psychologist Podcast with Dr. Marianne Trent.